The following is a conversation with Mark from the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Now, let me tell you, folks, Mark and I go into some real deep rabbit holes with regards to energy, uh, corruption, esotericism, uh, demagnetizing ley lines. I would also like to thank Mark personally for actually motivating me for some of the inspiration and content that will be delivered Um Members will be seeing this quite early, but the public will have already seen that public episode a while back with regards to um, an episode coming up very shortly. However, folks, I got to say, this is a real intense conversation, and I hope all of you enjoy it. Now, with that being said, there's one final thing I would like to say as well. We had recorded the Zoom call to record both audio and video. I'm not sure if there was a glitch after the call was over or if I accidentally deleted the video file, which I doubt, but I'm, I make mistakes. You know, everybody's human. So with that being said, I do want to say as well that this is strictly an audio episode. So I'll be honest with you folks. This is probably one of those episodes where you want to put it in your ears at work, doing some cleaning, going for a run, what have you because whether it's members or public, I'm very sorry, there is no visual. With that being said, of course, I'm glad that the main component and principalistic foundations uh, stuck on my computer, which was the audio file, right? So that's really what matters. Anyways, enough of me. Here we go. Cheers. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another long form episode. I know it's been a little while since we've done this. We plan to ramp up with more of the long form conversations. But without further ado, we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, Mark from My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. Mark, brother, thank you so much for coming on, sir. Thank you for having me, bro. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. I've listened to your show a little bit today and I'm really impressed. So uh, I'm hoping to uh, live up to the caliber of quality of information that you you constantly strive to put out. I think it's really good. I Well, first off, thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you. Uh, but just to start off the conversation, I mean, what got you into the, the whole, you know, sort of, um, I guess you could say truth seeking. I don't want to put a, you know, a connotation to it, but truth seeking experience. And again, not just podcasting, but the community. Um, you know, being so involved as you are and being helping as many people as you do and do, you know, going out of your way to assist people f- without any, uh, you know, financial reward, at least. What, what got you into all of that? Well, on the, the latter part of what you just said, I, I'm very confident in value for value, you know. So even though the cooperative is pretty much, you know, all above board, nobody's paying anything to be a part of it. There is a value that I gain from having it and being a part of it. And, uh, and yeah, there's going to be more and more as far as the community goes and my involvement in it. I've actually always been sort of a introspective kind of guy. I was the captain of my wrestling team, but for the most part, you know, before that moment, I was kind of like, eh, you know, to myself, I had friends, I had, you know, moments where I was like the class clown. But I had always been very independent when I was a young guy. And right. that led me to study the things that I was interested in. Because at the same time of being independent from the peers, I also felt very independent from the influence from the school and the church and the different, you know, people that were trying to shape my reality. And I, I just, I didn't excel very well in high school which made me kind of unmotivated to get to college. But around that time, cannabis, smoking every day, you know, I don't want to put it all on that because I think people can totally achieve everything I've achieved without the help of cannabis. But I would say, you know, reading just like, it's just going to sound weird, but nature books led me to, as a kid, to go further and further and further. And like, History always seemed boring, but as I got older, history became more and more interesting. And now I I love reading about, you know, what's gone on, excuse me, 100, 200, 300 years ago, you know, in my own area, especially because I feel like there is this sort of, uh, as it's been described to me through Jose Arguelles and David Icke, different authors who talk about time. You know, we don't actually live on a timeline. You know, that's just how we perceive history. We try to think of it in that linear fashion. But 
the more I look into it, the less I think there's anything linear about it. And I, you know, I was explaining it to my girlfriend the other day in this way. It's like, you know, <clears throat> we need to understand what's going on in the past to help us better understand the context of what we're dealing with right now. So that's, that's where I'm at now, how I got to this point, just always feeling like a rebel. You know, there's something inside of me that was a little bit like rebellious and wanted to question people. And, you know, that got me <laughs> accused of being a smart ass and all the other things that my right. parents would say for questioning, you know, their conservative values. And, you know, that made me seem very like liberal to them. But then I kind of switched and was like, you know, well, burn it all down and you know, with Trump and not to go into the political tangent, but my whole life, I'd been very interested in changing the world for the better, thinking, right. caring about others in that expanded way, which seems like, you know, in hindsight, like, well, what, what am I going to do? You know, I'm mm. not, I'm not more special than you or anyone else to change the world. So I didn't feel like, you know, oh, I was called to do something, but that I knew what that was, you know, it was kind of a right. precipice. And I think in our own unique ways, we all get called to that. And my point of bringing up the politics thing is I felt like no matter what side you took, it was all a form of social engineering. I didn't know what that term was back then, but it, it really felt that way. And I dropped out of college because the sociology class, I remember like the first week of my sophomore year of college, I was like, this is sociology, you know, I'm like, this is social engineering, like they're just trying to, you know, get us to go yes, 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 to, you know, this kind of corporate uh, uh, pilgrim-esque immigrant colony mindset, you know, that's just maybe the way I labeled it then, but I've always been very passionate about nature and why that connects to history is because, you know, somebody who's really close friends with my father is an indigenous American from this area, Connecticut, United States. And, uh, and just knowing him, you know, he wasn't like some fountainhead of wisdom, but just knowing him had an impression on me when I was a kid. And I always, felt like you know indians there's something there you know why do we call them indians why do we call them right. Native americans you know what's going on so and also like the whole cliche of like spirit animals and them having like totems and uh you know having a really deep connection with the earth which is not cliche it's very true mm. but i think people's understanding of that is very superficial so right. i you know more and more gotten interested in this stuff and two people who recently have really expanded my understanding of this whole these events that unfolded before america was formed the way it is now are ross ben and michael Wan. now michael Wan is a susquehanna alchemist and uh ross ben wrote a book called great mystery philadelphia uh really really interesting book and then his companion book is free your mind free your mound and your mind will follow. So, you wow. know, I was just an average dude delivering Amazon packages for the man, slaving away. Right. And uh, and I was listening to guys like Ross Ben and Michael Wan, you know, just like as this journey has unfolded, my instincts, my intuition, they point me in certain directions, you know. So right. People come podcasts episodes even if it's just one episode of a podcast or if it's like sam tripoli show i've listened to every single episode you know right and that's part of you know we'll get to that a little later on if we do but that's part of i think the foundation of learning that i created for myself in this kind of freelance uh no guarantees way where i'm just like learning about all this stuff and taking it in taking it in and, you know, the way Sam and I hooked up, it was so strange. You know, I go to a show, I give him a copy of the Kabbalion. You know, this is a book that I bought back when I was a kid, just smoking weed and trying to figure out the universe, figure out what is God. I knew right. the Catholic church in my hometown was all wrong, you know, and I felt like 
there might be something in like ancient Egypt. There might be something in ancient Greece. You know, I heard about the uh, secret wisdom schools that were in Greece. You know, I read this book, Secret History of the World, when I was pretty young. And that that was like, oh, OK, this, this is starting to make sense. Everybody's telling the same story. They're just using their own language to tell it you know or their, their own, own perception yeah, yeah right so so those things started coming into the fray and like joseph campbell archives i listened to that manly p hall risk you know read a lot of his work rudolf steiner read a lot of his work and as i'm learning all of this stuff I, I always found a job where i could read like i was a delivery guy for a chinese food place and in between uh deliveries i would read and then I had uh, a job at Whole Foods. Now, great opportunity to read, but on my lunch breaks, I would read. Right. <laughs> then I found podcasts and it was like, wow, okay, let me go back to that delivery job I had where I was free with my mental energy. I could listen to music. Didn't really have podcasts back then. I was like out of high school. But I um sorry, how many years ago was this? Just to give people some context. Oh, well. I personally didn't have podcasts back then. Uh, podcasts did exist. I just wasn't aware of them. Um, gotcha. This was in 2012. So okay. Okay. 2013, 2012. This is around when I graduated high school and I really started opening my mind to all this stuff. And it was like six or seven years later of learning and studying just as things came to me that I was like fully into podcasts. And I, I had a YouTube show and I went to see sam one day gave him the cabalion like i said sorry going off a little tangent. no 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 please please <laughs> but no worries brother. i think i think there's some some uh through line that we'll we'll see here so i give sam the cabalion not expecting anything just with the hopes that he'll read it and have a higher spiritual awareness because i felt like he had had guests on the show who had touched on it but just didn't really like hit it out of the park like I had hoped. And I was thinking, well, if he has this book, then maybe that could point him in the right direction to find someone who could talk about this. That's smart. This was, I got to give that to you, brother. That's smart. And well, thank you. I, and it wasn't, you know, it was just like, hey, I'm, I'm a fan of this guy. I want him to have this. And, you know, it ended up being a really good foot in the door to go on his show because I talked to him on his Patreon and I was like, hey, I'm the guy that gave you that book. Did you read it? And right. he was like, you know, yeah, uh, come on the Patreon and talk about it. One thing led to another. I'm uh, <laughs> driving. I'm driving this girl. Sorry, I'm trying to light this blunt over here. No problem. Uh, at all, I'm driving this girl. To, she's from Egypt of all places. OK, wow. So okay. we met we met through uh, Yale, not a student, never gone to Yale, but I was a bakery delivery guy on the uh, in town. So I would deliver within Yale campus and I ended up going to this sort of art studio for a couple months before the virus happened. Right. And um, right. And it was strange because because of that, this girl who lives in Egypt now she got stuck here in america for an extra couple months so here i am just like a single dude trying to uh spend some time with a, a good looking chick i took her up to like a lake in connecticut you know i'm like she's from egypt she's never seen something like this you know right yeah and, uh, <laughs> and she ends up we were, we were pretty good friends and she ends up asking me to give her a ride to the airport in virginia which is like a 10 hour drive from where I live. And I've never been that far South before. Mm. And this was like three months into the, the pandemic. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. I'll drive. There's probably not going to be any traffic. Everybody's afraid to go anywhere, you know? And there wasn't, it was beautiful. Uh, just, you know, trucks and, and maybe a couple people, but I've been driving for at least 10 years and I've never seen the roads that clear side note total side note either wow. way so i ended up driving her totally coincidentally to the dulles airport you know what that is <laughs> yeah i know what that yes, is yes yes right so here i am a guy who's only done like two patreon podcasts that nobody's seen uh with sam tripoli you know nobody special just another dude listening to podcasts and interested in this stuff and i end up having this rare opportunity to drive someone from egypt to the dulles airport so I'm could like, you, okay. Sorry, brother. Could you just give some context about Dallas? 
uh, just to our audience, for those who who might not know, just a brief. Yeah, Alan Dulles is a <laughs> definitely a shady guy in my book. He's behind uh, a lot of the foundational work that went into creating the CIA. I think he was around when it was the OSS and then created some of what we now know to be the CIA. And he was also in a sort of love triangle with somebody who was very close with Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, a famous psychoanalyst, you know, very influential with his work in psychology. This guy, Alan Dulles, was using Carl Jung, you know, as a sort of uh, unwitting mentor, you know, he was mm. getting all this psychology information from Carl Jung, Carl Jung not knowing, you know, what he was actually, who he was providing with this valuable information, but right. that's maybe a tangent, but it, it helps you understand like what they're actually doing They're Yeah. Maybe people have the perspective, oh, well, they're just defending our country. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, like they're, they're well, trying to yeah. to mind control people and if if that's limited to just our enemies well that's great but you know i don't believe that the well just the as a quick side you know is right is, it, well just as a quick side note if you had to get put a, a rough percentage you know 10 20 30 40 50 whatever how much for on a percentage basis based on what you've read what you've seen you know the people you've interviewed things like that and you've spoken to how much as a quick side thing, because I think the audience will enjoy this. How much do you think the CIA is genuinely like how many of their, I guess you could say missions or uh, objectives within their agenda are actually to help the wet, the people of the West for safety. And how much do you think is simply create the problem, create the solution somewhere in the world, and then just go dominate? Like how, if you had to, you know what I mean? If you had to ratio it. Hmm. I wouldn't even, I mean, it, it would be totally on the latter side of things, but I, I would even maybe be kind of a, a correction here and, and say sure. like, it, it's not so much that there's like, Hey, let's get together and be the best. It's like, they've always been the best and mm. they've constantly evolved to maintain that spot in the best. And I'm not, you know, valuing that position by using the word best. But, you know, if we're looking at the control, the control structure, they're the best at controlling, you know, well, that's why part of the wing of it, right, very quickly, if I could say that's also why the the CIA has their own drug department, because they feel they can do a better job than the DEA, they've always the CIA, it seems like who, whoever you compare it to, whether it has to do with space, whether it has to do with weather, whether it has to do with, you know, covert missions, they always seem to be, you know, like the the big no pun intended the big brother like you know mm. the the dea can't do what we do the nsa can't do what we do you know like right right and that's indicative of who they who they're ultimately supporting it's a you know elite bloodline royal families that were behind the federal shift in this country and created the federal reserve and all the other wings of the federal government that i don't think are constitutional but yeah, speaking right. Of, speaking of constitution, I mean, let's. So the Dulles Airport, CIA. Not an expert on that, but I would definitely turn to some of your older episodes because I'm sure you've covered this topic many times. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. And uh, and so I drop her off. You know, kind of a sad departure. She's a really nice person. You know that feeling when you meet someone internationally and then they go back to their other country. You know, yeah. Like, how long is this going to last? But right it's great you know it was a great opportunity to drive down there and i'm like and i'm sorry my headphones just fell over here no um and i'm like you know well traffic's not bad washington dc must be evacuated and empty so i went and i explored the geomancy in washington dc right so for those who aren't familiar Washington, D.C. is at the end of what's called the Chesapeake Bay, right? It's on the Chesapeake Bay. Well, the Chesapeake Bay is the mouth of the Susquehanna River. So for those who are familiar with Michael Wan's work, you'll know that the Susquehanna River is pretty important to the story in a sort of unconventional way as far as we know. Uh, conspiracy theories to be usually, ge you know, geographical landscape features don't really play a huge part in conspiracies traditionally. I mean, right. yeah. you know, so it's so for the, you know, 
person who's new to all this stuff, you might be like, how is this taking a turn into like rivers? What do rivers have to do with anything? Well, right. rivers have always been an extremely important source of life from fishing to hunting to just boating. I mean, boating before vehicles, the, as we know them, were invented. Boats were the only way to efficiently travel faster than you could with a horse or, you know, feet and, and travel course. very far over the oceans and whatnot. So, right. you know, rivers, oceans, coastlines, humans settle there. It's just for thousands of years, you'll see there's archaeological evidence that supports this there's physical evidence to this day that supports this just go to any beach it won't be too far from a house most likely right People like to live by the water it's, it's part of being human so i go to washington dc see the sites look at the big obelisk you know this massive like piece of stone sort of magnetically anchoring the energy in this place you know Right. And it's not accidental, you know, Washington, D.C., as many, many people know, like they created the country before they decided that was going to be the capital. So they had a, a pretty large amount of time, 10 to 15 to even 20 years of planning this, you know, city. And it's absolutely a geomantic spell. So what do I mean by that? Using certain celestial alignments they're able to calculate north they're able to calculate where the sun sets and rises and they're also able to calculate you know where the certain constellations will predictably be you know so with all that knowledge and the knowledge of land they were able to create almost an active spell with stone the sky in the land you know the sorry in did your sorry uh, did your reading of uh nature books have anything to factor in to, to this like was there a point where you had said to yourself after reading those nature books was there one particular point or did it take a certain time to read you know michael wan's books and others to say like you know wow there's a significance in rivers and to you know realize that arguably we're living in many different variations of a matrix if you want to call it was there a, a certain point in time I, I didn't mean to interrupt you I, but just to I, I figured it would flow well it does and you're thank you for giving me an opportunity to elaborate on that I would say my love of nature has always pushed me to look at the world a different way because it's pretty obvious if you have that perspective that our society doesn't honor respect or take care of nature in a uniform way right you have some places here and there who do a great job uh but that's a yeah. very small you know very small portion of what's really going on on the earth now the earth is very large and also i believe the earth is very powerful and can reset itself and and has its its own ability to heal itself in the same way our bodies do but you know just like our bodies can be overwhelmed by a toxin or a disease or something an ailment that could you know mean the end of our lives you know i think the earth might you know have that sort of programmed into it to reset before that happens you right know, there you know and that's getting super woo can't prove that you know this is all just a thought experiment for those who are more logically minded but that's what my intuition has always pointed me towards and i think having a love for nature and just like a reverence for that has kind of guided me to look at things differently and connect with my higher self you know like I was always against drugs and, and alcohol and all that stuff. And for whatever reason, I decided to smoke weed uh, when I was 16. And again, not trying to be an advocate for, for pot here because it's everybody's got to make their own choice. But I definitely think that that was what I needed as an individual to sh sharpen my intuition, my interest, and then hone it in and have the ability to focus. I mean, you know, with all the distractions like video games and internet and TV, all the things I grew up around, you know, being someone who graduated in 2012, born in 94, you know, it cannabis really brought me back to what I think it means to be an organic 
human being connected with your mind, body, and soul. And from that perspective, I'm more able to understand the world around me and also discern whether or not somebody like Michael Wan or Ross Ben is a valuable mentor to me. And I think that's all right. based on intuition. So no rivers as significant as they have been in my life. Don't didn't like really, I didn't understand it, you know, at all yeah. until I started seeing Michael Wan's work, but then in a sort of reverse time sort of way, I started to make these connections. For example, today I'm reading from this book right here, Spirit in the Stone. <clears throat> and I bought this book in Woodstock, New York. And I bought it because it talks about something called the Hamanasset line. And this is hmm. supposedly a ley line where there are several stone alignments and it even tracks the, let's see, the celestial equinox, I think the summer solstice and the winter solstice, as well as the fall. You know, it's, it's basically like a living compass, a, a, a standing compass. So you have a rock on Montauk Point that connects all the way to this island in Ontario off the lake, I think Lake Ontario. Sorry, is this on Ontario, California or Ontario, Canada? Canada. Can okay. It, yep. And it has, uh, there's an island called Manito, M A N I T O U Island. And this Hamanasset line, you know, crosses through there. So I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Cause I'm trying to think like, what, how does Connecticut play into this? You know, Michael right. Ron Ross Ben, they're studying Philadelphia, Susquehanna River, none of which is in Connecticut. So I'm like, I'm from Connecticut. How do I fit into this? So right. I start re-examining my life in a way and trying to like, okay, well, the Housatonic River comes from here to there. It goes to my hometown. That's where I was born. You know, so does either way, the connection right. that was relevant today was hunter mountain a year ago almost exactly a year ago uh before i met my my girlfriend uh who i'm now with and went to woodstock to get this book a couple months ago mm. i was in woodstock by myself just driving around following my intuition one of the practices that i was taking on, i think everybody should do this in their life uh is just go for a spirit ride you know get in your car with no destination you know, try to have a, a, some gas and, you know, maybe even limit yourself on time, but just drive and find somewhere that maybe you've never been before. And right. you know, that day I was happened to be near the New York, Connecticut border. And I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to drive into New York and, and see where I end up. And I end up near Woodstock, of course, you know, look at my background here, maybe <laughs> the hippie vibes. But it, it is very corporate, you know, it's not as mystical as someone like me would like. So I drove around and I, I moved on and I just kind of drove through the countryside. Well, I happened to see a mountain called Hunter Mountain and I took a picture of it. You know, no reason, just whatever. Cool sure. mountain, great view from where I had been parked. But it just dawned on me, like, take a picture of that. Sorry. I posted that on Instagram and that was it. Now, a year later, today, I'm looking in this book that, again, I had bought in Woodstock, and I only bought it because it mentioned Connecticut. So I'm like, cool. But I didn't, you know, <laughs> I didn't go through it all the way. Now, going through it a little further, I find that, you know, this, uh, this Hunter Mountain is a sacred site that's lined up on the Hammonasset line. So... Huh. I had recognized that intuitively, and now I'm piecing it together in this kind of way. Another example of that, Michael Wan, had him on my podcast, episode 25, was a great podcast. We hit it off. He invited me, uh, you know, he's like, oh, if you're ever in the area, come by, you know, just visit me at my place. I'm like, wow, great. And I happened to have that opportunity. I drove to Indiana at the beginning of this year. And on my way there, I called him up. I said, hey, man, I'm near the Susquehanna River. What should I check out? And he's like, well, you got to go here. So I start driving there and I see 
a sign and people on the East coast know what I'm talking about. I don't know how far into the United States these signs go, but you'll see these blue signs typically in New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, and they're historical markers. And they're usually blue and gold or blue and white, blue and black, but blue for the most part, sometimes Mm, red. And they have, you know, on this day, this thing happened here in this place. So I'm in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and I see a sign that says in 1626, a Connecticut colony came, you know, people from Connecticut had come to that exact spot, you know, however many years ago. So I'm like, that's weird, you know, and then I go to the spot that Michael told me to check out. Interesting, not too significant. Couldn't really get to the Susquehanna River in that town because the banks are really high so it just wasn't like we didn't want to like bushwhack down right. to the river no sorry but, just curious what is michael and what does michael propose is there a form of energy a form of uh you know if you were to do some type of i don't want to say ritual but some type of energetic practice of sorts would uh, would it be more prominent within that particular location and what's the significance of these because there's clearly a significance geographically but energetically frequentially is do you feel anything when you go there do you feel a difference compared to walking on a regular street um you know relative to being up in that mountain so i i can't speak for mike and i think if i could he would say something along these lines is different for everybody and why okay. i'm gonna say that is because and, and, and bear with me bear with me because I didn't really, I, you know, I'm kind of going a little all over the place here, but so I didn't elaborate as much as I should have. When I went to Washington, DC, I had to go home afterwards. I was only there for 20, 30 minutes. I probably got a coffee and left. Right. So went to whole foods, you know, I'm pretty predictable. (laughs) Um, So I go, I go through Pennsylvania, actually through Maryland first, and I'm about to go through Pennsylvania no rush, had nothing to do that day. And I had the whole day ahead of me. And I'm like, well, I've heard all this stuff about the Susquehanna River. Let me go check it out. So I drive, drive into Pennsylvania and I'm on the west side of the Susquehanna River, sort of near York, Pennsylvania, Red Lion, Pennsylvania, just driving through. And personally, from my personal experience, having sage, having tobacco having cannabis having some sort of offering that's a way to pray so for me you know right. that information kind of comes from a a mentor of mine who i met back when i was in community college taught me a lot about native american culture so from my perspective you know standing on the bank of the river speaking from my heart and expressing you know where I was in that moment and maybe even praying for what I wanted to happen or for what I want to happen. And typically when I'm in that moment, my prayers usually go towards helping others, you know, helping the little ones, helping the animals and the plants of this world. And I think, you know, just, just having that thought, you know, it's, there's something energetic about that. So I connected with the river in that way, in faith, in an energy way, because one thing I learned through this uh, guy named Mike Sant- Santana, Santana, I think he was on the higher side chats talking about like computers and AI and some sort of digital bowl manifestation with like a symbolic bowl. So hmm. I visualized this bowl in my head and then I visualized gold falling in the bowl and then I forgot all about it, right? Because I had no expectations. I just did it, left it there. Well, two weeks later, I'm working at a farmer's market and a gold coin falls on the table and I look up and there's nobody standing there. Whoever had dropped it had either like intentionally donated it and left and ran off or had dropped it and just turned their back and mixed back in with the crowd. It was a pretty busy farmer's market. Does this happen to you often? Well, that was, that was the standout manifestation that really showed me that right. the, the reason why that had happened was A, because in that moment, I realized I had to share that with my coworker because right. we both equally deserved it. Right. I think that sort of intention played a part in it, but also the forgetting, 
you know, Mm -hmm. not having an expectation to receive, but to set the intention that you're open to receiving. And that's what I did on the Susquehanna river. And less than three months later, I was working for Sam Tripoli talking about spirituality on his new podcast zero, right? He had me on as the third guest. And then, you know, he's like, who do you think I should have on next? And I gave, I emailed him like a 15 point list of all these different people, you know, and he's like, wow, okay, maybe, you know, do you want me to pay you to do this? And I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah. So <laughs> that's where, you know, that's where people might be like, well, why did he explain that whole story? Well, for me, from my perspective, nothing happens by accident. There's no coincidences, nothing's right. happenstance. So that moment on the river, connected me ultimately with Michael Wan, the Susquehanna alchemist. Cause if I didn't work for Tripoli, I wouldn't have had a reason to hit him, email him to put him on tinfall hat. And then, you know, eventually have him on my show. And, and that's the other thing. Sam inspired me to start my family thinks I'm crazy because when I told everybody in my family that I got a job working for Sam Tripoli, they were, they looked at me like I was crazy. Like what, that's not a job. Like, what do you mean? You're working on the internet for a comedian. How does that work? You know, like, so, Mm -hmm. and, and it, I just, just, I just wanted to say quickly, that's what bothers me about the sort of not even the older generation. Cause I don't want to put them all. There's some that adapt to the times, but that older mentality where if you're not leaving the house at a certain time in the morning and coming back in the afternoon, it's not considered a job, but I mean, it's all, again, I I do believe that's shifting and changing quite quickly, but I also think there's a lot of people that haven't caught on to that yet, but sorry, please go on. No. And, and yeah, you're absolutely right. That is a huge factor, but I think it's also, you know, like I alluded to the preparation that led me to having that opportunity with Sam, you know, not only had I listened to enough podcasts to be able to provide that service for Sam and, and be knowledgeable of this, you know, kind of, field if you want to call it that right. people and who who's interesting who has information and what information they have there's a lot you know and for whatever reason you know that studying i did as a young kid about nature and memorizing every animal and you know every country and where they're from and all these little things that i was interested in as a kid i realized now like oh, okay that's why i have the memory to catalog these things and so i think you know within everybody's personal story are a set of skills that have dawned on you organically. And when you put attention on those skills and cultivate those skills, you know, you start to grow more, you know, those seeds spread right. and the garden of who you are becomes more bountiful and beautiful. And that's just the process that I'm undergoing, you know, like Sam helped me out, gave me this opportunity in so many different ways, you know, not only to, to make money doing something that doesn't, you know, serve the matrix and the man, but also, you know, spreading truth and sharing knowledge and putting him in a position to speak to other really smart people who can share things that I can't, you know? Right. Right. Well, speaking of that, that kind of takes me to my next question, which one of the great things about you and I sort of having this conversation is that it's, it's very rare where I I don't necessarily have to prepare and it just kind of flows. And I want to thank you for that. But there was a uh, Russian, um, a former Russian general now retired. My audience knows that I speak about this quite extensively. He said that in his book back in the 1980s, they were able using no chemicals, no tech, no hardware or anything. They were able to tune the human brain using a certain to a, a, they were tuning it, excuse me, to an energy contour. Basically, he described it as if you were fine tuning a radio to communicate frequentially to other Gallic, other uh, galaxies that had alien civilizations. And he didn't want to, he could not go into detail about how it was done because I really do believe, and I think he knows that if he told everyone in his book how to do it, everyone would be able to. But my question to you is, do you think there's been a suppression of those type of abilities? And if so, do you think there's been an energetic one? Do you think it's put in the food? Do you think it's in the water? I mean, a little bit of everything. What's your take on that? I love that question. I love that where we're going to go with that. So, you know, part of where I'm at and why I am who I am and why I told that story that maybe isn't, you know, totally relatable 
because you know how many people get an opportunity to work for a comedian that also does a conspiracy podcast and there's <laughs> not many so i do feel really lucky but at the same time you know, i've been studying this kind of thing for a while and i was prepared for the opportunity so i want to like encourage people to look within and create that situation for themselves so that can express itself however it will whether that even means being involved in podcasting or not you know because for me it certainly has evolved into researching things in my own backyard including my answer to your question which is it is absolutely dietary it is absolutely a symptom of the indoctrination process and the society building that the elite have practiced that's a skill of theirs is managing people and, and figuring out the best way to lead a society that's the whole reason america was founded the way it was you know they said oh yeah go there to have religious freedom well what they don't tell you is you know <laughs> these religions a lot of in a lot of cases and i don't want to you know discourage anybody who is very religious or spiritual from having faith but i will say that there's a certain amount of programming and they're like well let's see you know who who does a better job of programming you know the quakers the protestants the catholics let them all have land and see who does the best job and then we'll let the pieces fall where they may i think in a lot of ways if you look at francis bacon and everything he did that's exactly what was going on they're making an experiment out of this land i think a byproduct of that was you know the desecration of the native american indigenous culture but mm. uh, to answer your question a little further not only is it dietary not only is it indoctrination which they also you know put that on the indigenous people indoctrinated them into christianity and and all of that uh, in canada all the way down to chile and argentina but you know here we go the geo necromancy they're literally finding ley lines sacred sites and then demagnetizing them why would they want to demagnetize sacred oh sites? i didn't dude i'm i'm i didn't even think of that i didn't right? even think they're demagnetizing the okay so please go on i'm really interested in this now so so you know one thing that emerged you know over the past two years is the whole inquiry into tartaria you know everything is a melted building or something is like you know buried in mud and then uncovered and so there's a lot of angles and theories i think the most interesting within that realm is everything dealing with the electric universe and how these buildings were possibly conductors of energy right right yeah so we have like cathedral cathode you know there's no coincidence there why you know, and even down to the way of those buildings are shaped, it looks like they're like waiting for a lightning bolt to like hit it, you know, like you right. see in like Scooby-Doo at the beginning of Scooby-Doo, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, back to the, the point. So we have this culture of people who potentially were either the remnants from the Atlantean culture or a breakaway culture from Africa, you know, everybody wonders where the aztecs came from out of nowhere with all their knowledge and abilities and information right to me i think it's vibration it's electricity people who understand cultures that understand that we're an electric universe are able to vibrate those stones to make them lighter than air and place them where they are that's why you have huge megalithic stones placed in ways that are just inconceivable with our materialist paradigm technology you know? right yeah. So I think, you know, part of their knowledge, their esoteric knowledge, the royal bloodline that's passed this esoteric knowledge through the church, through Rome, through Egypt, Babylon, you know, you can trace that through line of this occult secret society sort of group. It's, it's not to mention the different names. Right. Sorry. Not to mention the censorship and curation of what they've given to the public exactly the right. esoteric versus the exoteric they always right. give us you know the crumbs while they get the meat you know we get the the bread while they get the actual like you know meat to chew on the right stuff that everybody who kind of wakes up like cannabis offered for me uh that wake up moment you start to be like well you know this stuff isn't 
I need something more to chew on, you know, and you start looking deeper. Right. So, you know, back to the, the demagnetizing the earth. If you look all over in every city, you know, across the United States in a town hall, in a town square, what do they have? They have stone monuments. They have obelisks. They have stone pillars. They have plaques on stones. Right. And they've even gone and taken some of these mounds that the indigenous cultures were building and flattened them, leveled them, destroyed them, or even just built on top of them or renamed yeah. or repurposed, built a statue on top of it. Right. And all of this is a demagnetizing, you know, metal. Metal is not, you know, it's it, it's everything comes from the earth. You know, there's no such thing as like a, a unorganic material. Ultimately, you know, even though we right. find things to their smaller parts and create plastic, which doesn't well, as seem they natural. as they say, as they say, our best tricks come from nature. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> and, and but, you know, when we look at metal, you know, especially when it comes to being a bioluminescent organic being that we are metal zaps our natural aura it has a negative effect on our human aura mm. and i think our human aura our energy bodies are restored by the magnetic electric energy that is exchanged as we stand between the earth and the sky right you know? and when ancient people were building these stone structures they were trying to create a larger version of that so that you would have a sort of toroidal field built around these structures so that anyone who came in contact, I mean, I don't know if I've never been to Teotihuacan or, or any pyramid, but I'm sure anyone who has, you know, I've heard people say this, that there's just a sense of awe, you know, and some people might just say that's because it's such a beautiful building. But I think you and I, if we went there, we might say like, from a more logical perspective, like, hmm, I am actually feeling something like right. all yeah. bias aside, all pre-assumptions pre aside, there is a buzz here, you know, even like the most logical person would have to like lie to themselves because they wouldn't, you know, see that in their paradigm. So they might just say like, oh, well, I'm in awe because this building's magnificent or there's a lot of human energy here, you know, however they'll write it off. Well, that's, the end sorry, of the day, if, if, if I could say it very quickly, that's like when yeah. um, I have some family, they've been to, you know, Shangri-La, they've been to, personally myself, I haven't, but they've been to these parts where there's these ancient structures and you name it. And very quickly, um, my 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 uncle was telling me a story about how, you know, he went with his high school to I believe it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Shangri-La, if I'm not mistaken, however, I could be wrong. But anyways, it was one of these very ancient, you know, trying to figure out nowadays how they did it type of thing. And then all of a sudden, my uncle says to the to the teacher or the, the guide, excuse me, what's that over there? And then the guide says, oh, that's an observatory. And my uncle says, wait, 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 when was it built? And the guide goes, well, at the time that, you know, everything else was. And my uncle is, thinks to himself in his head, why do they need an observatory? How did they even know, right? Let alone map out the constellations of stars, of things that only we can see now with our digital telescopes. But sorry, pl please go on. Right. And that, you know, highlights what we initially danced around, which was the stone alignments. Right. Why, why are the indigenous people of my area, the area I was born, uh, you know, lining structures up to this Hamanasset line? Well, these are people that according to what, you know, people say, because I never met an indigenous person from this time, but according to what's written and what's passed down, they were migratory people, you know, they would go one place when it was cold, they'd come another place when it was warm. So it was very important to them to have a bearing on what part, part of the year it was exact timing. So they can say like, okay, when we're all the way up here, you know, in the summer, in the north part, we need to know on this day to get moving because it's going to take this long to get down to long island you know right it's going to be warm enough to survive the winter that might be a month or a two month track you know right in those days so those kind of timing uh you know from that logical perspective we could say okay well that makes sense these people were moving great distances they needed to have a good bearing on what time of the year it was and even mm. you know uh where they were 
Because right. they could follow this line if they knew where each stone alignment was and maybe even like live their whole year based on what part of the line they're on, you know? Right, yeah. And when we're thinking about this as like a ley line, it's like, oh, wow, okay, interesting. So now they're like following energy back and forth. Are they aware of that? I would say from the less, you know, logical perspective, yeah, probably because we are intuitive beings. And there's something that's conscious about our environment that interacts with us, you know, like ayahuasca. I've never done it. It's a huge topic. It's a huge thing for people, especially people who listen to these types of shows. Psilocy and, uh, psilocybin, ayahuasca, the whole thing. Yeah. Right. But particularly ayahuasca, I bring that up because the story is, you know, the Hivaro people or who, whichever indigenous tribe discovered the right concoction, the right mixture. Mm. They didn't figure it out by trial and error. <laughs> you know, they were told <laughs> by you know, spirits. They would have killed a lot of their own friends and, and relatives if they did trial and error. There's a lot of poisonous plants in the, in the Amazon jungle and creatures right. too. Right. You know? So you don't have time to just like go exploring <laughs> and testing different plants. And to it, pass, or, pass around the ayahuasca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they found out of all the plants, you know, that this Benisteriopis vine had the MAOI inhibitor in it that took the DMT out of all these other plants because most plants have DMT in there. You don't have to go very far to find DMT, mm. you know, but that MAOI inhibitor in that vine is very rare. So they talked about, you know, well, we didn't figure it out. Our spirit guides told us, our, our ancestors told us, you know, whichever you know, label you want to put on it, there was a multi-dimensional, interdimensional, otherworldly explanation for how they got that very, now, very important information that is, right. you, know, you take that drug and what happens, you kind of go into another dimension, you know, so I think that indicates that our world is conscious. Now, would you say that the the the, the purpose for the demagnetization 